folks, this is Pastor Mike Hoggard coming to you from Studio 2013 with another Watchmen video broadcast. This is the second part of our enduring series on the mystery of the fourth kingdom. What is this fourth kingdom all about? We started out last week uh, doing just sort of an exegetical study, verse by verse, line upon line study of Daniel chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar's dream, Daniel's revealing of that dream and the interpretation of that dream. And uh, we're going to cover one more thing with that dream, and then we're going to go back and look at precisely what this fourth kingdom is. And we're going to follow the text of the scriptures to let the Bible reveal to us the truth and the true nature of this. We were talking uh, last week about, uh, in Daniel chapter 2, verse 34, Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and brake them to pieces. And then, so that's what Nebuchadnezzar saw. He saw this image and the four parts to the image. Something very, very interesting about that is that it starts out as being gold and it descends down. The, the head is gold. And, and Daniel said, Nebuchadnezzar, you're that head of gold. Uh, but then it reduces not only in height, but it reduces in value from gold to silver. Then it reduces once again from silver to brass. Then once again from brass to iron. And then miry clay, which is like has no value whatsoever. You don't go to the store and find a ring for your wife that's made out of dirt. You just don't do it. So anyway, it descends in value. It descends in height. And then he sees a stone cut out without hands. We were talking last week, the difference in, in stones, which you see stones in the Bible. The stone cut without hands is Christ. A stone cut with hands and carved out is a picture of Antichrist. They give life to the image of the beast and so on. So we have this stone cut out without hands. It's a picture of the return of Christ, the 1,000 year reign of Christ, and he establishes a kingdom that will be forever and ever and ever. So thou sawest, till thou, uh, thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and of clay, and brake them to pieces. And then he says in verse 44, And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand Forever. That's the kingdom that I want to be a part of. Praise the Lord. Uh, there was one aspect of this that I, that I didn't cover last week that I think is very, very interesting. And I remember the first time I saw this in Scripture, I knew that it was a connection to what is going to happen in the last days. The stone is destroying the kingdoms. In Deuteronomy chapter 17, notice this verse here, verse 2. If there be found among you within any of thy gates which the Lord thy God giveth thee, man or woman, that hath wrought wickedness in the sight of the Lord thy God in transgressing his covenant, and hath gone and served other gods and worshipped them, either the sun or moon or any of the host of heaven, which I have not commanded. And it be told thee, and thou hast heard of it, and inquired diligently, and behold, it be true in the thing certain that such abomination is wrought in Israel." Then shalt thou bring forth that man or that woman which have committed that wicked thing unto thy gates, even that man or that woman, and shalt stone them with stones till they die. Now, I want you to understand what's being, and to me, this is so obvious that this is a reference. This is the law of God and is a reference to what is going to happen in the last days. When the stone cut without hands destroys this, this king, it destroys the kingdom as well. And the kingdom would be all the people of that kingdom and the king itself. And here was the rule that God said. He said, I give you laws. I give you a way to live, and that way to live is by serving me. But he said, if you transgress this and go serving after other gods and worship them, he said, transgressing his covenant, that was represented by the Ten Commandments, written on tables of what? Stone. So the, the curse for violating the Ten Commandments, violating God's covenant, God's law of the Old Testament, was that you were to be taken out after inquiry, after a trial, after witnesses and so on, 
And if you transgressed the covenant and went and served after other gods, they were to take you outside the gates and they were to do exact, they were, you know what they were doing? They were acting out the prophecy of the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ to destroy the kingdoms of the last days. Thou shalt stone them with stones till they die. Now this is, I think, is very important to remember. And I keep mentioning the, the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, uh, keeping the commandments. There are some who are trying to convince you that the way to God and the way to please God is by going back and keeping all of the Old Testament commandments. Or they say, here, no, here's what they say. To try as best as you can to keep the Old Testament commandments. That honors and pleases God. The problem with them, and it sounds, what sounds good, you know, maybe I shouldn't commit adultery. Yeah, maybe I shouldn't lie. Maybe I shouldn't covet. Maybe I should keep the Passover. Maybe I should do all these feast days. Maybe I should do that. And they're telling you that that pleases God. And in some cases, they try to hint that actually God likes you better than all these grace people. Here's the problem. According to the scriptures, and I'm going to show you this, if you break one law, you've broken the whole law. If a man offends the law in one point, he is guilty of all. And according to some, there's, they said there's like 618 laws in the Levitical you know, priesthood and the law of the Old Covenant. I don't know, maybe there is. So let's say that you keep 617 of them, and one of them you break. Did you know that you're under the exact same curse as the guy who breaks all of them? It doesn't matter. So by thinking that, well, I'm keeping some of these laws, I'm actually pleasing God better than all you Baptists over there, all you people over there, that's, it's a lie. God requires strict obedience to every law that he gave. And there was only one that did that. There was only one that ever pleased God by keeping the law. And that was his son, Jesus Christ. So what does that leave us with? The new covenant of grace. So here's what I'm showing you. What, I'm, what the Bible, I believe, is teaching you, there's a connection between these ten toes. And I'm going to show you that in a little bit. Because the, the, the law for violating the covenant of God, for violating the laws of God and, and being sinful, was that you were to be stoned with stones. And so everybody who is part of this fourth kingdom is, a, is an unregenerated sinner and they are getting the curse of God upon them by the stone being cut without hands coming down and destroying that kingdom. And so <clears throat> we, we see that, of course, in Deuteronomy 17. And then I want us to look at Daniel, back in Daniel chapter 2, look at verse 42. Because he doesn't just mention the feet of this image. He mentions specifically the toes that represent this kingdom. Daniel chapter 2 verse 42, and as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. I and how many toes were there? There was 10. These are not my feet. I'm not going to put my feet up on the desk. There are 10 toes. I think, and I believe the scriptures bears this out, and I'm going to show it to you. There is a connection between these 10 toes, the 10 horns that are on the beast, the 10 horns that are on uh, the dragon and the Ten Commandments. And I'll show it to you. I'm not saying the law is bad. No way. I'm like Paul in Romans 7. Every time I do something wrong, I consent that the law is good. The law is good. It's good not to lie. It's good not to commit adultery. It's good not to steal. Problem is, I can't do it. And since I can't do it, since I cannot keep every law that God said, I must rely upon the grace of God. But you know as well as I do, there are people out there who are trying to please God, whether they are part of Hebrew roots or Judaism, or they're part of morals and they're part of Freemasonry, because Freemasonry says that when God sees the lambskin apron that a Mason wears, which, hmm, let's think about this, sheep's clothing on a person. They, they look like a sheep on the outside, but what are they on the inside? Anyway, they, the Masonry teaches when you stand before God, he sees that lambskin apron, and that is your righteousness. And he accepts you into heaven on that basis. That's a work salvation. Mormonism 
requires strict obedience, and the grace of God only kicks in after you have done everything that you can. Mormon doctrine also teaches that if you have righteousness on you, and you have been forgiven of a sin, if you go out and commit that sin again, all your righteousness and all your forgiveness is gone. It's a works salvation system. It's a system that says, I will do and please God. And it's a lie. It's a setup is what it is. I see a lot of non-Catholic churches moving in that same direction. Oh, if you do this, if you do that, then God will bless you. Course in Miracles, the same way. All of this stuff, Seventh-day Adventism, Adventism, the great controversy, says if you keep the Fourth Commandment. I will show you that. I'll get there. It says if you keep the commandments, God will be pleased with you. And if you break one of them, then you're not going to heaven. You have the mark of the beast. It's all about how you can do righteousness and be part of the kingdom of God. And the problem is we can't do it. So what I'm going to show you, according to the scriptures, the ten toes of this, of this image of this fourth kingdom coincide with the ten horns, which are ten kings, and they represent something that has dominion over mankind. Watch this. Daniel chapter 7. Remember the ten toes. Daniel chapter 7. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth, and it devoured and break in pieces. Notice the iron teeth. And stamped the residue with the feet of it, and it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it. Note that, we're going to see it again, and it had ten horns. And I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots, and behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. And so here again, we have the fourth kingdom with ten toes. Daniel 7, and I believe that they coincide with one another. We have the fourth beast rising up, and he has ten horns. And out of those ten horns, out of uh, one of them, another little horn comes up. Three of the previous horns were plucked up and taken out of the way. We might look at that a little bit later on. Now look in Revelation chapter 17. Verse 12, and the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the lamb, and the lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and king of kings, and they that are with him are called, are called and chosen and faithful. Look at this verse. This is, I love this. Because watch this, let's, let's just now, here are the ten toes, they are represented as ten horns, and these ten horns, according to scripture, are ten kings. Remember, kings have dominion. Anything that wears a crown has dominion uh, over people. These ten kings have dominion over mankind. Now, watch this, and they have one mind. And th it's the ten kings, the ten horns, the ten toes, that give their power and their strength unto the beast. Think about these words. What is it that is the strength of sin? These ten kings give their strength to the beast. Think about this. This entire image, gold, silver, brass, and iron, is actually being held up and sustained by ten toes. That's it. These ten toes. So where, where did the stone attack it at? On the toes. And when it removed the strength of this image, they all fell. So this verse again, these shall make war with the Lamb. Think about what Jesus said. The Spirit truly is willing the flesh is weak. You know what's wrong with the flesh? It's under the bondage and the curse of the Ten Commandments, which we cannot keep. And our body, our mind is constantly fighting us, wanting to, oh, I want to lie. Oh, I want to steal that. Oh, I want that. Oh, I'm not going to honor God. I'm going to honor me. We are constantly at war. And so these Ten Kings, the law, 
are enmity against Christ. And these shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. Grace conquers the curse of the law. For he is Lord of lords and King of kings. Remember how this image started? The head of gold? Nebuchadnezzar, that's you. You are a king of kings. But here comes the king of kings and Lord of lords and destroys the power of the ten. The lamb, the stone cut without hands, overcomes the ten toes, the ten horns, the ten kings. I love this. Now, let's go back a little bit. There's, there's just a piece of information that, that I happen to know. You've ever heard of Atlantis? Now, some say Atlantis is real. Some say it's not real. What I like to do is I like to see what the scriptures have to say about that. Let's look at the idea of Atlantis because uh, Plato had described this, what is called this lost city. Um, and Atlantis, I think, is important in end times prophecy. You remember it was uh, Francis Bacon, um, this occultist during the about 400 years ago that wrote a book called The New Atlantis. And he envisioned this country across the seas that was going to rise up and, have, and, and bring the world into a new age of enlightenment. And many people say that that began um, the, um, the, uh, the building up of the nation that we now know as the United States of America. But this idea of Atlantis, Plato wrote about this, and he wrote about it as if it were true. Here's what he described. He described this massive kingdom that was sunk under the water under a great flood. So let's think about this for a minute. Let's think about, was there a time on the earth when the world was overcome with a flood? Yes, Genesis 6 and Genesis 7. Here's something interesting that Plato described. He described this, this island or this nation, this kingdom of Atlantis, as being partitioned into ten islands with ten kings that ruled over them and these ten kings had one king that was superior to all the others. And here's, here's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking that that describes what we see in the scriptures as the, the world before the flood. And you know that the sons of God and the daughters of men and the giants and all the things they did. And God destroyed the earth by water and destroyed all of these. Well... Um, Freemasonry, the New Age movement, Manley Hall talks about this. He says Atlantis is a symbol. Atlantis is a type of this kingdom rising again in the last days from the depths of the sea in the last days. And these ten kings and this one great king taking rule over mankind again. It's referred to in the Grail legends as the once and future king. Uh, here is an image of, it's not actually a photograph I took of Atlantis, all right? Just an artist's conception of what Plato was drawing. Now, um, I'm going to take that concept and let's go look at something that I've been studying here for the, about the past year. It's very, very difficult to understand and I don't encourage you to do this. Uh, but in response to some of the teachings on, from the, that I have seen from the Hebrew roots, I've noticed that they've gotten it directly from, not the scriptures, but a book called the Zohar. The Zohar is Kabbalah, Jewish mysticism. It is the religion that God told the Israelites not to learn from the Canaanites, the Hizzites, the Peravites, and all these other ites in the land of Canaan. And the Jews went in there, and since they didn't destroy them all, they became thorns in their sides, and they learned their religions. And what they did over time was they engrafted this paganism into Judaism, and so around, I don't know, seven, eight hundred years ago, something like that, they, they wrote this very mystical book called the Zohar. And in the Zohar, they teach of what's called a tree of life. Now, here's the problem. There were two trees in the midst of the garden. There was a tree of life and a tree of knowledge of good and evil. Well, did you know that the, the Kabbalah tree of life actually has good on one side and evil on the other? The male, the female, the hard and the soft. They actually have that in there. So it's not really the tree of life. It's the other one. And here's a picture. Here's a graphic of what's called the Sephiroth, the tree of life. I want you to notice 
That, of course, there's this winding snake in it. That ought to tell you where the religion comes from. And I want you to notice that you have all these lines going back to these circles and moving around in these circles and so on. I'll just tell you there's 22 of these lines. There's 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. There's 22 amino acids that make up your DNA, that write the letters of your DNA. And just throw that in there because that's eventually where we're going to go. But I want you to look at these circles. There's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 of these circles. Here is what Manly Hall, this is how he describes what those circles are. Take a look at this. He says, the Sephirothic tree is sometimes depicted as a human body, thus more definitely establishing the true identity of the first or heavenly man, Adam Kadmon, the idea of the universe. I'll just stop right here. Adam Kadmon is the Antichrist. That's who that is. Just, you know, just when you read that, Kabbalah is so hard to understand, but what little I get from it, Adam Kadmon is the Antichrist. So let's move on. The ten, notice they call them divine globes. These are spirits, not humans. The ten divine globes, Sephiroth, are then considered as analogous to the ten sacred members and organs of the protogonos. The grand man thus conceived is the gigantic image of Nebuchadnezzar's dream with head of gold, arms and chest of silver, body of brass, legs of iron, and feet of clay. The medieval Kabbalist also assigned one of the Ten Commandments and a tenth part of the Lord's Prayer in sequential order to each of the Ten Sephiroth. So what is it that all of these are referencing? And remember, in dealing with this fourth kingdom, what I'm showing you is that whether it's Masonry, Mormonism, uh, Jehovah's Witness, or Seventh-day Adventist, any kind of work salvation, the New Age movement, magic, witchcraft, it doesn't matter. All of these are leading to the same kingdom, the same God over all of these. Many, many roads lead to the same God, the Antichrist, Adam Kadmon, the grand man, is what he's referred to in, in, um, in uh, Manly Hall's The Secret Teachings of All Ages. And so Manly Hall, gathering his information from all of the mystery cults of the world, started putting everything together, and he basically said, see all these little groups over here? He said they're all pretty much part of a mystery cult, and even though they call it this over here and that over there, he said they're basically speaking of the one gigantic mystery. And it all references the fourth kingdom, and, the, and he's saying the ten globes that are on the Sephiroth are ten divine kings, not human ones, spirit kings that are analogous to the image that Nebuchadnezzar saw, the ten toes, so that the Sephiroth, those ten circles, are the ten toes, the ten horns, the ten kings, and even he said the Kabbalists, the medieval Kabbalists, assigned one of these circles to each one of the ten commandments. There's the connection right there. Because the beast, the grand man, is the man of sin. He is the culmination of everybody's disobeying the Ten Commandments. And since they disobey the Ten Commandments and they are not redeemed by the blood of the Lamb of the New Testament, they are going to fall under the curse and the dominion of the Antichrist and those Ten Kings. I strongly, and I'm still working on this, I strongly encourage you, if anyone comes to you and says, I know you're a Christian, but the way to really please God is by keeping His commandments. It's a setup. It's a setup. Should you commit adultery? No, of course not. Do everything you can. But don't rely upon you doing for your salvation. That's a trap. It's already been done by Jesus Christ. So let's look at this number 10 for a minute. 10 is the number four dominion. We have, uh, watch this, okay? We have, uh, we have 10 toes on this image. And let's say, you remember when you were kids and you used to wrestle one another and 
whoever was standing on top of the other kid, that that kid won. Okay, because I, you know, I own you. I'm standing on you. I own you. I win. Uh, whether it's King of the Hill or whatever it is we used to play. Okay, when you with ten toes represent dominion. God told Joshua, every place the sole of your foot touches, I will give unto you. You're going to own that. That's dominion over you. So these ten represent the ten horns, which are ten kings. Horns represent power. We'll see that. Uh, these are ten kings. So it represents dominion. Incidentally, but not accidentally, the first king we find recorded in the scriptures is in Genesis chapter 10. Guess who he is? And Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth, and he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore, it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was, let's count, Babel, and Erech, and Akkad, and Kauna in the land of Shinar. How many kingdoms, how many cities did he have? One, two, three, four. He had four of them. So here we have in Genesis 10, the first king, the first kingdom, and it's four, excuse me, four kingdoms that he rules over. Nebuch excuse me, Nimrod is a prototype of the beast of the last days who comes as a result of this fourth kingdom that comes to the earth in the last days. Now let's look at Exodus chapter 34, verse 28. And he was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. Notice that 4 times 10, 40. He did neither eat bread nor drink water, and he wrote upon the tables the words of the covenant, the 10 commandments. And so here is God's law over people. And again, don't get me wrong. The law is wonderful. Trying to keep the 10 commandments, that's just good. It's good advice. Problem is, we can't do it. You might, you might not have ever cheated on your wife. But if you ever looked at your neighbor's house and said, you know, they got a better house than me. You broke the law. If you ever looked at your neighbor's wife, you broke the law. You might can keep eight, nine laws. Try not coveting. Try not lusting. You can't do it. So now there's a curse. Unless you're redeemed, there is a curse on you. Let me show you what it looks like. Deuteronomy 28. Listen to what God said. Moreover, all these curses shall come upon thee and shall pursue thee and overtake thee. Now let's stop right here. These curses are based upon the law and they'll overtake thee. What does that mean? They're going to step on you. They're going to rule over you. They're going to have dominion over you, and they're going to crush you. Till thou be destroyed, because, because thou hearkenest not unto the voice of the Lord thy God to keep his commandments and his statutes, which he commanded. Now, he says earlier in Deuteronomy 28, you go look it up, that if you don't do all of these statutes, then this is what's going to happen to you. Notice the curse for not keeping all ten commandments. Verse 48, Therefore shalt thou serve thine enemies, see the dominion, which the Lord shall send against thee in hunger and in thirst and in nakedness and in one of all things. Let's count again. The Lord shall send against thee in hunger, in thirst, and in nakedness, and in one of all things. There it is right there. The fourth kingdom being a result of the curse of not keeping the Ten Commandments. And he shall put a yoke of iron. There, look at, look at this. The that the fourth kingdom is iron. What is it that Paul told us not to be unequally yoked together with who? Unbelievers. So here we have iron yoked with clay. So God said, He shall put a yoke of iron upon thy neck until he have destroyed thee. The Lord shall bring a nation, this is your fourth kingdom, against thee from far, from the end of the earth, as swift as the eagle flieth. We're going to see that. A nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand, a nation of fierce countenance, which shall not regard the person of the old, nor show favor to the young. Did you know that in the book of Daniel, God describes the Antichrist as a king of fierce countenance? We have the king of fierce countenance. We have the nation of fierce countenance that rules over them and, and has four things on them and has dominion over them. And all of this because they didn't keep all ten 
commandments. There's a curse on everybody right now because the law has dominion over them. Romans chapter 7, verse 23, but I see another law um, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Now, I'm going to stop right here. Paul mentioned, let, let's go over here. Paul mentioned in, uh, in Romans chapter 7, verse 1, Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion, ten, over a man as long as he liveth. The law has dominion over you as long as you live. And as long as you live, and if you break one of those commandments, then that's sin. So notice what Paul said. Now, Paul was, I mean, he's the chief of all the greatest of all the apostles, the greatest evangelist, the greatest pastor, the greatest preacher that ever walked the face of this earth. Look how he described himself. He was a wretched sinner. Why? Because he, at some time, just broke one commandment of God. Notice what he said, I see, I see another law in my, in my members, my body, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. Captivity, bondage, dominion, the number 10, and it's the law of sin. The law is not sin, but when you break it, it's the law of sin. Now, Paul said, I have a different law in my mind. It's the law of righteousness. It's the new covenant saved by grace. Look what he says in verse 25. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Look at Romans 8, 2. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. And so the idea here is, and here Paul talk, had talked about, uh, the law hath dominion over man as long as he liveth. And I'm going to show you something else related to that here in a minute. He said, that law exists in my flesh body. And it's the law of sin. The law of sin. The law of sin and death is what's going to happen. You know what the number for death is in the Bible? It's the number five. Adam died in Genesis chapter five. He's mentioned five times. One, two, three, four, five. And then he dies. And you can, uh, we did a video called the pinnacle of power. You can get more information on that. But I want you to remember when we go back to Daniel chapter 2, it was the kingdom of gold, silver, brass, iron, and clay. The law mingled into mankind and it brings death. So Paul called it the law of sin and death. But Paul had been set free from the dominion of this Antichrist kingdom by the blood of Jesus Christ. Now I want to show you this. There's actually, God actually drew a picture of what this looks like. In Romans chapter 7 verse 1, Know ye not, brethren, for I speak unto them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over man as long as he liveth. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. So then if, while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she should be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no, no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Now, Paul had mentioned here, the law has dominion over men, and he said, it says in the law, it's like we're like a woman. A woman who is married to a man, that man has dominion over her, bears rule over her. So if she leaves that guy and runs out and goes against somebody else, she's called an adulterer. That husband rules over her as long as he is alive. But if that husband dies, she's now free to marry another. Do you know that Israel was betrothed to God? And God wrote her a bill of divorcement. That means she is not free to marry another man. And she's not free to remarry God. The only way that she can be free is if her husband dies. And he did at Calvary. And so now Israel is free to marry the new husband, Jesus at his second coming. That is so beautiful. Here's a picture of that. We have a story in 1 Samuel 25. I read this for the first time years ago, and I just cried. God, that's so beautiful. So here we have, here we have David. He's a type of Christ. We have Abigail, who's a type of Israel. She's a woman. 
And she is a woman who lives under cruel authority, bondage, dominion, mean. She's married to a guy by the name of Nabal. Nabal was mean, hard-headed, stubborn, wicked, wouldn't listen to anybody. David, if you remember, David went to Nabal and sent his servants and said, hey, we've been protecting your land. I've got guys here. Uh, we, need, we need victuals. Will you help us out? And Nabal said, who are you? And David was going to go kill him. And Abigail went to David and said, please don't kill him. Please don't do it. Don't do this wickedness. And David said, okay, I'll listen to you. Because Christ listens to his bride. That's what happens when we pray. And so here's what happens. Nabal threw a big party, got drunk. And when he woke up from his drunkenness, Abigail told him what had happened, that David was seeking to kill him. And Abigail went to talk and talked him out of it. Let me show you what the Bible says happened to Nabal. In verse 37, 1 Samuel 25, But when it came to pass in the morning, when the wine was gone out of Nabal, and his wife had told him these things, that his heart died within him, and he became as a stone. And it came to pass about ten days after. Stop right here. Ten days and the stone. That's the law that has dominion. That is Nabal who has dominion over Abigail as long as he lives. So Nabal, his heart turned to stone, and he lived ten days. And then look at what happened. After that, the Lord smote Nabal that he died. And when, stop right here. Here is Jesus who comes. He is the betrothed husband of Israel in the Old Covenant. And he is smitten. And he is made under the law. He's made to be sin for us who knew no sin. And he's smitten, and he dies. So look at this. And when David, verse 39, when David heard that Nabal was dead, he said, Blessed be the Lord that hath pleaded the cause of my reproach from the hand of Nabal, and hath kept his servant from evil. For the Lord hath returned the wickedness of Nabal upon his own head. And David sent and communed with Abigail to take her to him to wife. Mm -mm -mm. That is so. See, that's a picture. God draws pictures of prophecy and doctrine in the scriptures, and so, so all the Hebrew roots people and all these Seventh Day people and all these people said, "Oh no, got to go keep the law." They're dragging you back to a dead husband. That's what they're doing. I don't want that one. I want the husband that's going to appear in the clouds one of these days. I love that. So let's break this down here. Uh, here is this, uh, there's a graphic of the image that Nebuchadnezzar built. You notice the gold, the silver, the, the brass, the iron, and then the miry clay. So these ten make war against the Lamb. The commandments are at war against Christ, who is the, is, is the Spirit of God. And the Lamb prevails over the law, the ten, the ten toes, the ten horns, the ten kings. The law prevails, or excuse me, Christ prevails over them. And so now he's the stone cut without hands, and when he destroys the strength of sin, which is the law, the whole image falls away, and it is ground to powder, and it's seen no more. So that's, the, that's that beautiful image of the stone cut without hands. That's the doctrine of it. That is why it happens exactly that. Notice God didn't pull a pistol on the thing and shoot it. He didn't take a hatchet to it. He didn't do anything like that. The stone cut without hands. The, law, the, 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 the lamb made war against the ten kings, prevailed over them, crushed them as chaff and as powder, and they were blown away in the summer threshing floor. And now that stone of righteousness becomes a kingdom. That's so beautiful. Uh, so we have the ten toes... And they are part of miry clay. We understand that. We're made of clay. We'll see more about that later. But they're also of iron. Let's get a good idea. Let's look at the symbolism of iron in the scriptures. In fact, the first place that iron shows up is in Genesis chapter 4. Take a look at it. We have Zillah. She also bare Tubal Cain, an instructor of every artificer of brass and iron, and the sister of Tubal Cain was Naama. Now, Genesis chapter 4 is a very, very interesting chapter. We're going to see pictures here. We're going to see uh, Abel and Cain. You know the story because Tubal Cain 
named after Cain. He comes from the lineage of Cain. And we're going to see the opposites here, just like we did in other places. So the Bible talks about Abel and Cain and what they represent. Hebrews 11:4. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. Stop right here again. I love this. Okay? Um, Abel offers a better sacrifice than Cain. Christ offers a better sacrifice than the sacrifices that were under the law. God never accepted the blood of bulls and goats to be for the remission of man's sins. It was a type of what the better sacrifice of Christ on the cross. So we have a picture here. We have a picture of the New Testament in Abel. The Bible says his blood speaks from the ground in Genesis 4. The Bible also says that the blood of Christ speaks things better than that of Abel. So here we have Abel representing the new covenant and the sacrifice that is accepted by God. And Cain represented of the ten toes, the ten kings, a sacrifice not accepted by God. Uh, 1 John chapter 3, verse 12, Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother. And wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil, and his brother's were righteous. So watch this. Now see the types here. Cain takes life to serve himself. Abel gave his life. So we have the two types. We have Christ and Antichrist. We have by, by faith Abel. We have the law of faith that brings salvation and grace. Or we have the law that brings cursing. Cain who was of that wicked one, the devil. Boy, I love these types. So watch this now. Now Cain is the one, Genesis 4, 15, the Lord saith unto him, therefore whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. So now Cain and his lineage of the rejected sacrifice, the dominion of the law, has a mark on him. Think about in the last days, the man of sin, puts a mark on either everybody's forehead or their right hand. Think about this. So now his lineage, the lineage that comes from Cain, has that, has that curse on it. Genesis 4, 19. Lamech took unto him two wives. And so Lamech, in this particular case here, Lamech was the offspring of Cain. We have another Lamech who's the offspring of Seth. Lamech took unto him two wives. The name of the one was Ada, the name of the other Zillah. And Ada bare Jabal, he was the father of such as dwell in tents and such as have cattle. And his brother's name was Jubal, he was the father of all of such as handled the harp and organ. And Zillah, she also bare Tubal Cain, an instructor of every artificer in brass and iron. And the sister of Tubal Cain was Naama. Let's, let's look at this for a minute. How many, how many children did Lamech have? Jabal, Jubal. Tubal, Cain, and a fourth one that's different from the other three because she's a girl. Zillah. You see the four here? It's a, it's a rejected bondage curse. And, and here we, we even have this. We have, uh, the Bible talks about in Genesis chapter 5, if you follow the, the lineages of Adam, you find that Enoch is the seventh of Adam. And that's what Jude said. Eni even Enoch, the seventh Adam, said this. And we have the prophesy, or the prophesying of Enoch in Jude, which says, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to, you know, bear rule over the ungodly. So we have Enoch, who was the seventh from Adam, on the good side. We have Lamech, who was also the seventh from Adam, on the bad side. Enoch prophesies unto the Lord in righteousness. Lamech is a murderer who boasts that if anybody kills him, judgment and vengeance would be on them 70 times 7. Very, or 70 and 7 times. Very, very interesting. Here's something that Albert Pike makes reference of. It's interesting that of all the characters in the Bible, 
Masonry draws your attention to the one who came from the seventh from Adam through the lineage of Cain, makes mention of Tubal Cain, who is the father of all of those who work with iron. In fact, there's a Masonic emblem. It's of a cane and two balls. Yeah. Yeah, if, if you're thinking that, that's what it is. That's masonry for you. That's their God. That's what they worship. Here is what uh, Fat Albert Pike said about Tubal Cain. That's what he said. Masonry has made a working man and his associates the heroes of her principal legend and himself the companion of kings. The idea is as simple and true as it is sublime. From first to last, masonry is work. Stop right here. Do you see that? All of these religious ideas have to do with performance of a work in order to attain godhood. This one says, the law, it, the work has already been done, accept it by faith. So you see the difference between uh, Abel and Cain? Abel's sacrifice was done by faith. It was a better sacrifice than Cain, which was of works. Masonry is a works, salvation, religion. So, he says, the idea is as simple and true as it is sublime. From first to last, masonry is work. It venerates the grand architect of the universe. It commemorates the building of a temple. Its principal emblems are the working tools of masons and artisans. It preserves the name of the first worker in brass and iron as one of its passwords. Apparently, there's a secret password in masonry. I don't know. I've never joined a lodge. A secret password in masonry. It's Tubal Cain. The guy in the fourth chapter on the law side, Cain's side, that was the worker of iron. Something interesting is that the name Tubal Cain going from after the Tower of Babel and, late, and the languages were confused, going from one language, you know how like, uh, my name is Michael, my full name is Michael, in Spanish it's Miguel, um, in, um, in Russian it's Mikhail, uh, and it all comes from Hebrew. It's, it has variances when you go from language to language, and the same is with Tubal Cain. The variance that takes place down the years and through the languages is of a god by the name of Vulcan, Tubal Cain, Vulcan. Here is the god of Vulcan. He is the god of fire. And notice the anvil, notice the hammer. He is a worker. Vulcan, Tubal Cain, is the worker of iron who pulls the iron out of the fire and works it. The god of the Old Testament, the god of Freemasonry, the god of... Uh, of uh, all the New Age movement, the God of the last days, the Antichrist, is a God of works. Our God is a God of faith. Interesting. I am, try not to be, a Trekkie. Now, let me give you some words here. A Trekkie is a person who likes to watch Star Trek. Okay? I admit it. I just watched Into Darkness. I'm going to be talking about that soon. Okay? Very interesting. Um, a Trekker is a guy who dresses up like a King Klingon and goes kapla at the Star Trek conventions. That's the difference. I'm not a Trekker. I'm a Trekkie. The main character of all the Star Trek genre, the guy that has been in most of the Star Trek movies, was in uh, Star Trek the original series, The Next Generation. Spock. What is he? You know Gene Roddenberry, he was a New Ager, and I think a Mason. And Spock, uh, uh, excuse me, Gene Roddenberry had two, uh, two worlds. They were the enemies of the Federation. One was Romulus and one was Remus. That was the two gods who were the brothers who formed Rome, the Roman Empire. He also had a group of characters on there that were from the planet 
Vulcan. That's who Spock was. What, excuse me, Spock wasn't all Vulcan. Spock was a hybrid between the Vulcan world, the iron, and the human world. Da, da, da. You see that? See the name, Vulcan, two Vulcan? It all makes sense. We're still dealing with the fourth uh, chapter of the Bible, Genesis chapter 4. There is so much in there, but we're getting this understanding of what this iron represents. Now we look at, we're going to look at this idea of this fourth kingdom and how we can identify it in Scripture. Daniel chapter 2, verse 40, and the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces, and so doeth all things, and as iron that breaketh all these, shall it break in pieces and bruise. So we understand that this iron kingdom, this fourth kingdom, is actually going to be a kingdom of immense power. It's actually going to have power over everything in the earth. It's going to break everything. It can destroy anything. It can do anything it wants, and you can't go against it. Think of Think of a superhero by the name of Iron Man, okay? Bullets can't stop him. He, he's got all the power. You can't stop him. The man of steel. Steel is iron. That's what it is, okay? And he's invincible, invulnerable. He can't, you can't stop the man of steel. You can't stop the Iron Man. So we know that this kingdom is going to be more powerful than anything in this earth. Now, that is something I think that is very important. Now, think of all the kingdoms. You know, the, the Bible talked about Nebuchadnezzar being a, a king, and he's actually the, the, the a king of kings. And it mentions the silver kingdom underneath him was going to be a lesser kingdom. But what's interesting is, is that the lesser kingdom took control of the kingdom of Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom didn't last forever. And, of course, there was a kingdom that was the Medo-Persian Empire, and then the Grecian Empire took control over Medo-Persia, and then the Roman Empire took control over the Grecian Empire. So anytime even you have a, a world empire like, I don't know, let's say America, there's always something that can conquer it, always something that can defeat it. But in this case here, the fourth kingdom on the earth is unconquerable as far as mankind is concerned. What do they say in Revelation 13? Who is likened to the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Nobody on earth can. Nobody can stop it. So what does that tell you? It leads you to believe that the fourth kingdom is actually not of this world. It's not part of what we see here. It's from someplace else. So let's do this. Let's do a study of the number four in the scriptures and let the scriptures give us light on what this fourth kingdom. Now, if, 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 it, was, if it just stopped at the third kingdom, we would be studying that number. But it doesn't. It goes to the fourth kingdom. And the fourth kingdom is diverse. Remember the four beasts. And the fourth one is diverse from the other three. It's different. There's something about it that's different. You ever study the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? You notice that... Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the Synoptic Gospels. They're pretty much the same. John's different. Let me show you why. Let's study the number four in the Scriptures. First place we go to. Genesis chapter 1, verse 14. God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. Notice that in Genesis 1, the lights in the firmament are going to be for signs, seasons, days, years. Four things. By the way, how many seasons? Summer, autumn, winter, spring. Think about it. Okay? Let them be for lights in the firmament of heaven to give light upon the earth, and it was so. God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good and the evening and the morning were the fourth day. So on the fourth day, God creates the heavenly hosts. We know that the stars are figurative in the scriptures 
of the angels. The morning stars sang together. The sons of God shouted for joy, Job said. The Bible says in Revelation 12, the dragon takes his tail and, and casts down a third of what? The stars. And then it says the angels, his angels, cast them down to the earth. This all plays into that, we'll see. But on the fourth day of creation, God created the spiritual world and the creatures that inhabit the spiritual world. The sun, God said, don't worship the sun. The moon, God said, don't worship the moon. And all the stars, God said, don't worship the stars. We're not worshiping these little globes that exist in the universe that are, you know, melting hot heat. These represent angels, and God said, don't worship them. So we see a connection between the fourth day of creation, the number four, signs, seasons, days, and years. We see a connection between that and spiritual beings. Let's keep looking. Ephesians chapter 3. I'll never forget the first time I read this. I was expecting three dimensions. What I saw was four. Ephesians 3.17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height. I looked at that and I said, why are there four directions? I know what breadth is. That's me when I turn sideways. I have breadth. Length, I know what length is. This table is this long. And depth, okay? How, how long is it? This way. So we have this way, this way, and this way. That's three dimensions. You and I exist in a three-dimensional universe. But he mentioned four. Height. So I'm looking at that and I'm going, what is that? Four directions. Fourth one. I've never seen that before. So I started studying height. Let me show you from the Bible what it says. Job 22, 12. Is not God in the height of heaven? And behold, the height of the stars, how high they are. Right here, we're looking at this fourth direction. God calling it height. And it's where God lives and the stars live. And they don't live, God doesn't live in this three-dimensional realm. He lives in heaven. The height. Is not God in the height of the heaven? Behold the height of the stars, how high they are. Psalm 102, 19. We're going to see a double witness to this. For he hath looked down from the height of his sanctuary, from heaven did the Lord behold the earth. Psalm 148, 1. Praise ye the Lord, praise ye the Lord from the heavens, praise him from the heights. Proverbs 25, 3, the heaven for height, and the earth for depth, and the heart of kings is unsearchable. Stop right here. Notice in Proverbs 25, verse 3, the heavens represent the height, and the earth represents the depth. So we go back to Ephesians, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and depth. That's this world here, the earth, but the heavenly realm is the height. So if you don't like the, the idea of a fourth dimension, just think of the spiritual realm. And that's what that number four is talking about. So let's, let's very quickly go back now to, to Daniel chapter 2, this fourth kingdom. I don't, believe, I don't believe that this fourth kingdom is made up of humans. That one big gigantic human who's smarter than everybody else, some guy named, uh, what was it uh, Tim LaHaye called him? Uh, anyway, um, some guy that just is smarter than everybody else and rules over everybody. Oh, no, uh-uh. The, the fourth kingdom is not from this world. It's from the height. Okay, I want to show you that. Um, so think about this. Think about Matthew chapter 4. We have a story in the Bible of Satan tempting Christ. Look what is being mentioned here. Matthew chapter 4 verse 8. Again the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. Look in Luke 4, 5. The devil taking him up into an high mountain showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. 
Look at the language of these two verses here. We have, we have the devil taking Christ up, so he's going into the height, into not just a high mountain, a high mountain that exceeds. And the word exceed is it's gone beyond a boundary. Have you ever exceeded the speed limit? Yes, you have. You've gone beyond the boundary. That's, word, that's what the word exceed means. Remember what they heard at the base of Mount Sinai. They heard the sound of a trumpet exceeding loud. It wasn't an earthly trumpet. It was a trumpet being blown in the heavenly realms. So that's why it wasn't just loud. It was exceeding loud. All this from the language of the King James Bible. I love it. So he takes him up to an exceeding high mountain. He takes him into an area where he doesn't just see Jerusalem. And of course, you and I, even if we get on top of, you know, Mount Everest or on top of the World Trade Towers, apparently from the World Trade Towers, you're up so high you can see the curvature of the earth. But then that's all you can see because once the ships sail over the horizon, they, they tend to look like they're going down. You can't see them anymore. The devil doesn't just take him up to the top of Mount Everest. He takes him to an exceeding high place and he shows him all the kingdoms of the world. How? in a moment of time, just like that. That must have been beyond the boundaries of this three-dimensional linear time world that you and I exist in. We can't see all of the king. We can't even see, I can't see what's in this room all at once in a moment of time. I have to go here and let that, then there's the camera, there's the light, there's my ties, there's the computer, there's the uh, pure Bible study set. Here's the books. I cannot do that in an instant, in a moment of time. Because I'm bound by linear time in a three-dimensional world. But the devil took him up to an exceeding high mountain where he saw all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. He could see around the curvature of the earth in a moment of time. A fourth dimension. A fourth direction. And I could not even begin now to point in that direction. I just know that it's up. Consider this. When Christ left his disciples in the book of Acts, which direction did he go? Up. Think about this. He keeps going up. And now that he's past the, the, uh, the upper atmosphere of the earth, when you get into space, what direction's up? You ever think, I know maybe you never thought about that. I have. He didn't just go up. He went to the height. He went to heaven. Um, when I started looking at this, I'm going, Hoggart, are, are you just making this up or what? Uh, I, let, let me just say this. I'm not as smart as my wife thinks I am. Anyway. Um, I did not do well in math. I did not do well in geometry. I, I cl the highest mountain I climbed in high school was beginning algebra. And that waited till I was a senior. But I didn't take any geometry after that or trigonometry. I didn't take anything like that. So for me to understand anything like this, it must, it must come from, from God, from, this, from the scriptures. I wouldn't even begin to comprehend it. But it's interesting, when I started looking out in the scientific world, and mathematical world, and places like that, physics and areas like that, and began to see what scientists were talking about as far as what they believed was the fourth dimension or the fourth direction, I found some very amazing similarities between what science said and what the Bible says. I believe the Bible is a perfectly accurate record and instrument for measuring everything that is in the creation of God. I absolutely, because God spoke the universe into existence. This is his spoken word. There it is right there. And this is what I'm going to show you. Let's go back to the 1800s. God by the name of August Mobius, you may have heard of that name before, in 1827 had made the discovery that it, it would be possible to turn a three-dimensional object into its mirror image by means of a rotation in four-dimensional space. So already in uh, 1827, you have a theoretical idea of a fourth dimension, a fourth direction, and that it would be possible 
to turn a three-dimensional object into its mirror image if it went into the fourth dimension. Now, I'm going to show you that from scriptures in a little bit, but if you've ever seen the Mobius strip, that's what that is. It's, it's his idea of a three-dimensional object being turned into the fourth dimension. Then you have E.A. Abbott, who is a Victorian schoolmaster and clergyman who published in 1884 his famous novel called Flatland. It's about two-dimensional creatures called Flatlanders who dare to imagine life in a three-dimensional universe called Spaceland, and even a four-dimensional world called Thoughtland. Now let me kind of explain two dimensions very quickly. If I hold my hand over this desk, and you can do this. Everybody do this at home. You have a light source. Hold your hand over the desk, okay? Notice that the shadow of your hand has length and width. It has two dimensions, but it does not have any depth to it. It does not have three dimensions. And here's the rule, and I'm, you're going to like this. A three-dimensional object casts a two-dimensional shadow. Hang on to that one. You may have heard me talk about this before, but you're going to like this. I promise you. So what you're seeing, what I'm seeing on the table is a two-dimensional object. And since it has no depth, my hand, my three-dimensional object, can pass through it with ease. I am not hindered by this two-dimensional object in any way, shape, or form. In fact, this two-dimensional object is altered by my presence. Hang on to this, okay? You, you're, you, if you're going ahead of me, going to Scripture, keep going, okay? But anyway, uh, this guy, 1884, is theorizing about what the fourth dimension would be like by envisioning what the two dimension is like and a third dimension and being introduced into it. That's the area that we live in. That's what we can see right now. Then we have a guy by the name of Charles Hinton, 1888. In his books, A New Era of Thought and The Fourth Dimension, 1904, theorized that the three-dimensionality of space is a necessary condition of man's consciousness. However, it is necessary only to normal awareness. Altered states of consciousness, such as those experienced by mystics and psychics, acquired four-dimensional perspectives. Stop right here. Marilyn Ferguson, Helen Blavatsky, that's what they were talking about. A new consciousness that opens the eyes to a fourth dimension. Think about this. My two eyes can see three dimensions. Actually, if I close one eye, I lose my stereoscopic vision, and one eye can only see two dimensions. It cannot perceive depth. So I open my second eye. Now I can perceive depth. Now I can see in three dimensions. What is all this new age stuff talking about? Opening up a third eye so you can see into four directions. And this guy, Charles Hinton, in his book, The Fourth Dimension, was already bringing the esoteric mystery religions into the science. And then we have Hinton's Tesseract. It's a cube within a cube that when the Tesseract is rotated, the inner cube becomes the outer cube, and then vice versa. So if I were to take this, okay, and I were to rotate it, uh, the top part simply becomes the bottom, and the bottom simply becomes the top. A fourth dimensional object, when it's rotated, the tesseract, the inward cube becomes the outward, and the outward becomes the inward, and as it rotates, that's, and I know that's kind of hard. There's actually an animated picture of this on the Internet, and you can kind of see how it works, all right? That's about as good as we can get it as far as understanding it. Now, here is the, remember I mentioned the esoteric part. There is a mystery cult religion and a link to this fourth dimension idea. Because if you've ever watched any superhero movies lately, and they seem to have a fascination with, the Tesseract. It shows up first in Captain America. One of Hitler's guys is getting a hold of the Tesseract. Thor. Thor. And what was the Tesseract in Thor? It was the portal from one dimension to the Earth dimension. So we have the Avengers, and they're going to use the Tesseract as a key to opening up a portal 
so that these gods can come down, take over the planet. Are you kidding me? Fourth dimension. Then we have Charles Dodgson, a.k.a. Lewis Carroll. He was writing about the fourth dimension when he wrote a book called Alice's Adventures in the Looking Glass. Because what was being thought of back in the 1800s was, uh, you remember this guy said uh, when you go, when a three-dimensional object goes into the fourth dimension, it becomes its opposite. When you stand in front of a mirror, think about this. This is kind of weird. You stand in front of a mirror, and you raise your right hand in the mirror. What is that guy in the mirror doing? What hand is he raising up? His left hand. I mean, stop right here, go do it, and then come back. Okay? When you, when you wink your left eye, it's the right eye on the guy in the mirror. And that's what Lewis Carroll, Charles Dobson, who was a physicist, mathematician, was theorizing what it would be like to go through the looking glass into the fourth dimension. You didn't know that, did you? Go study it. Okay? So that concept led to a guy by the name of H.G. Wells who wrote the time machine. The time machine had the ability of going outside of the barrier of three-dimensional linear time into the fourth dimension to travel in any place in a moment of time that he wanted. That then led to Russian mathematician Hermann Minkowski, who theorized a fourth dimensional space time continuum. There you go, Star Trekkies. We know what that is. Uh, Jordy, what's going on? Uh, apparently, Captain, there is a fourth dimensional space time continuum rift out there that the Enterprise is fixing. I see, I've seen that episode. Okay? Space time continuum. That, that was because. Dodgson wrote about this uh, going through the looking glass. H.G. Wells writes The Time Machine. Minkowski develops his idea of four-dimensional space-time continuum, and that led to Einstein in his equation, energy equals matter times the speed of light, the constant speed of light squared. Because Albert Einstein theorized that the fourth dimension was escaping the barrier of time. Think about all the things now. Think about it. So that in itself, since it's just been going one after another, is the basis for what they call quantum physics or quantum mechanics. And I don't quite understand all of that, but I do know that there is a gigantic machine in Europe that is searching for, it's a large Haldron Collider, and it has a statue of the Antichrist out in front of it, Shiva the Destroyer, and they're trying to smash atoms into each other to try to discover the fourth dimension. That's what they're doing. They call it the God Particle. Very, very interesting. So let's break this down. These are the basic ideas of the fourth dimension. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take you right in the scripture and I'm going to show you them. They were there all the time. They were there all the time. Let me show you this. Number one, a fourth spatial direction that we cannot currently perceive or point to in our three-dimensional space. Number two, a fourth-dimensional object is not bound by three-dimensional space. Number three, upon entering the fourth dimension, you become your opposite or mirror image. Number four, the barrier between dimensions is likened to a mirror or a watery, glassy surface. Number five, a fourth dimensional object casts a three dimensional shadow. And if you know the scriptures, you're already going, I know what that is, I know what that is. Let's look at them. First of all, the first one is a fourth spatial direction that we cannot currently perceive or point to in our three dimensional space. So, Mark chapter 16, verse 19. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. Acts chapter 1, verse 9. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. Even in 2 Kings 2, 11, this is the rapture of Elijah. And it came to pass, as they still went on and talked, that, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind, where? Where? into heaven. 
We know that the Bible associates this fourth spatial direction with words such as height and up and heavens. And if we were to say, okay, where's heaven? It's that way. Where's hell? It's that way. Okay? Uh, and the truth of it is, hell, the bottomless pit, why is it bottomless? It's in a fourth spatial dimension that has no bottom. So we have evidence in the scripture. Once Christ, again, once Christ left the upper atmosphere of the earth, and he's in space, he's in the second heaven, which way is up? Which way is up? There is no up and down and sideways in space. Where is he going? To the third heaven, which is the fourth dimension. Okay, so the scriptures bear that out. The second one, a, a let me let me read this. A fourth dimensional object is not bound by three dimensional space. So watch this. Okay, you're going to like this. In Daniel chapter three, verse twenty-five, he answered and said, "Lo, this is Nebuchadnezzar. I see four men loose. How many men? Four." walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Look at the number. Instead of three being in the fiery furnace, burning and screaming, we have four. And the fourth one is Jesus Christ himself, the Son of God, who, who somehow, someway, takes the other three into the fourth dimension, the fourth spatial direction, the spirit realm, so that the three-dimensional space and everything in the third dimension, three dimensions, has no effect on them whatsoever. When they come out of the pit, they didn't even smell like smoke. It's almost as if they were there, but they weren't really there. Think of my shadow and it's two dimensions, and it's by a th three-dimensional object, and another three-dimensional object passing through. I don't feel where the shadow starts. I don't feel that. I has no bound that has no effect upon me whatsoever. That's what happened in the fiery furnace. Here's another example, Mark 16, 12. After that, he appeared in another form unto two of them. Look at what the Bible says. He appeared in another form unto two of them. As they walked and went into the country, and they went and told it unto the residue, neither believed they them. In Luke 24, the parallel to this, the Bible says, And it came to pass, as he sat at meat with them, he took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave to them. And their eyes were open, and they knew him, and he vanished out of their sight. Okay? Look at the two-dimensional shadow. The three-dimensional object goes into the shadow, and the shadow perceives part of it. But then when the third-dimensional object, all it has to do is go up a little bit, and now the two-dimensional shadow world cannot see it. Instantly vanished. Here's another one. Matthew 14, 25. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them walking on the sea. What hour was it? fourth watch, okay, and he comes walking on the sea. He can do that because it has no effect on him whatsoever. Isn't that beautiful? This Bible, all oh, this Bible's right. Now let's look at the third part here. Uh, upon entering the fourth dimension, you become your opposite or mirror image. 1 Corinthians 13, 12. You probably already know this one. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know, even as also I am known. Now we see through a glass, looking glass. 2 Corinthians 3, 18. But we all with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Look at that. Look at what the, the scientists were theorizing. I believe that a third dimensional object going to fourth dimension becomes its mirror image. Hmm, that's just, that's just brilliant. And it was right there in Scripture. Paul had it revealed to him the whole time. He said, we all with open face, beholding as in a glass, when I look in the mirror, you know what I'm looking at? My exact opposite. I am wicked. Jesus is holy. I am flesh. He is spirit. 
I am mortal. He is immortal. I will perish. He never goes away. He lives forever. So the Bible says that we're going to be changed into that same image from glory to glory. Think about this. You're going to like this. And this is all getting an understanding now of this fourth kingdom. I have three parts to me, spirit, soul, and body. That's three. But 1 Corinthians 15 says that I'm going to get something else, a new body. And it's not going to be like this one. It's going to be different. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Um, and then a barrier. The barrier between third dimension and fourth dimension is like a, it's like a, a mirror or something like that. Job 37, 18, Hast thou with him spread out the sky, which is strong and as a molten looking glass? Job said that what we're seeing up here is a mirror separating us in the three-dimensional realm from the spiritual realm, the fourth spatial direction. Ezekiel 1, verse 5, Also out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures, and this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. Four living creatures that came out of one of the cardinal directions, south, west, east, north. They came out of the fourth direction. They are four living creatures. Okay, and then verse 22, And the likeness of the firmament upon the heads of the living creature was as the color of the terrible crystal stretched forth over their heads above. Um, Revelation chapter 4 says, And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne, round about their throne, were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. Daniel chapter 7, verse 2. Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of the heavens drove upon the great sea, and four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. Do you see what the Bible's telling you? Job said the sky is like a molten mirror, a molten looking glass. Um, Ezekiel sees the four living creatures coming from the fourth direction, and then he says that on their heads was like a, a, like a crystal. And John sees the same thing. He calls it a sea of glass like unto crystal, and it's a mirror. It's a reflection. And then we have the four beasts. When the four winds strive upon these beasts, they come up from the sea, the looking glass. They come from their world into ours. These are not just, these four beasts are not just metaphors of, well, I think the, I think the bear is Russia. And I think, oh, let's see, let's imagine that the line with eagle wings is Britain and America. That's, that's just made up. The true understanding of this is that these kingdoms and these beasts are not, this is why they look the way they do. John and, and Ezekiel were not just writing metaphors and symbols. They were describing what God was revealing to them. They were, that's what they look like. Four faces, four wings and all this stuff. Okay, So the barrier, here it is, the Bible's telling you the barrier between the third and fourth dimension is like a mirror, like a sea of glass. Mm -mm -mm. Now watch this. Matthew 12, 40. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights where? In the heart of the earth. Your heart has four chambers. Where did Jesus, we know that his flesh body stayed in the tomb. It was his soul that went to the heart of the earth. This is where the prison is sort of like if you've seen Superman, the um, the Phantom Zone. This is where the prism or the prison is, and that's where Jesus went to the heart of the earth. And your heart has four chambers. And by the way, your heart is surrounded by a sea of glass. It's called the pericardium, and it's a sack full of water that separates the the heart, the four chambers from the rest of your body, and it's made out of salt water. Mm -mm -mm. Isn't that beautiful? And then the fifth, the fifth thing, what was, what was the fifth thing here that we came up with here? The fourth dimensional object casts a three-dimensional 
shadow. Just like this here. Three-dimensional object casts a two-dimensional shadow. So hence, a fourth dimensional something or another, something that is in the fourth spatial direction, the, the spiritual world, where God and the angels all exist, casts a three-dimensional shadow. When I read that, I shouted, because that is exactly what the King James Bible says, word for word. Colossians 2, 16 and 17, Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of any holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come. But the body is of Christ. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 4, For if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law, who serve unto the example and shadow of of heavenly things. As Moses, I, I'm just, th this is so beautiful to me. There was an earthly tabernacle. You know what it was? It was a three dimensional shadow of the fourth dimensional uh, tabernacle of God in heaven. And the Bible's telling us don't, don't try to go back to the shadow, it's just a shadow. Go to the real. If you said, boy, I sure am hungry, and a guy says, well, I got this big, juicy bacon cheeseburger here. Well, I wouldn't mind having a bite of that. Well, he says, here's the shadow of it. Why don't you eat on that for a while? Well, that won't fill me. That won't do anything for me. Bingo. You got it. People are this. You know what all this is doing? You know, you know what the Knights of Temple are looking for? The, I, I believe that some of these people are looking for the Ark of the Covenant. You know what it is? It's just the shadow of the real ark of the New Testament that's in heaven. Okay? So, who serve under the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle, for see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed thee in the mount. Hebrews 10, 1, for the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. And so if I were, you know, if, you, if somebody was saying, where's, where's Mike? And all of a sudden a shadow appeared around the corner, you'd say, well, I think Mike's coming. How do you know that? Well, there's his shadow. You wouldn't just say, hi, Mike. How are you? You wouldn't talk to my shadow. There'd be something wrong with you. You know what you would do? You would wait patiently for Mike to show up. And all that Old Testament stuff, that's a shadow, a three-dimensional shadow. That Bible is right. That's not just some metaphorical language. That Bible is accurate and perfect in everything that it says. And, and all of these things in the Old Testament are simply a shadow of what's in heaven. That's so beautiful. So think about this. The law is the Old Testament, which is a shadow. This is earthly things. The New Testament is dealing with heavenly things. And the Old Testament, all of the Old Testament being a shadow of things to come, they all point to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That's how the New Testament starts out. So watch this. Look at how the tabernacle was built. You'll see all these fours all over it telling you it's a shadow of what's to come. Exodus 27, 16, the gate of the court had four pillars. One, two, three, four. How do you get into that? Through the four pillars. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. That's the shadow of of heavenly things. Look at the candlestick. In the candlestick shall be four bowls made like unto almonds. What is the candlestick? Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, light unto my path. There were seven of them. The words of the Lord are pure words. As silver tried to the furnace of earth, purified seven times. The four bowls held the oil that supplied the light. The four bowls. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Pointing you to the Gospels. Now, I'll, again, remember this has to do with what that fourth kingdom is and what it represents and what its goal is. Uh, even the altar, Exodus 27, 1, thou shalt make an altar of shinwood, thorns, 
Thorns, that's what Shittim is, thorns. Five cubits long, five cubits broad, the altar shall be four square. Look at that. And the height thereof shall be three cubits. Thou shalt make the horns upon it, the four corners thereof. So it's four square, and it has four horns on the four corners. It's showing you that it's a shadow of what's in heaven, but it's not the real. It's only the shadow. Exodus 36, and every wise-hearted man among them that wrought the work of the tabernacle made ten curtains of fine twine linen and blue and purple and scarlet. How many colors? Linen, blue, purple, and scarlet. Four colors. With cherubims of cunning work made he them. The length of one curtain was twenty and eight cubits, and the breadth of one curtain was four cubits. And uh, the curtains were of all one size. Twenty-eight by four. How many fours are in that? Well, let's see, 28 is 7 times 4. The 7 golden candlesticks and the 4 bowls that supplied the light. The tent covering, 28 cubits, 7 times 4 by 4 cubits. You see, it's all a shadow of things to come. It was a shadow of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Let me run down this very quickly. I'm going to show you. You're going to like this because we have the four Gospels. The first three, I mentioned this a while ago, are the synoptic Gospels because Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you find pretty much in Matthew 24, Luke 13, or excuse me, Mark 13, Luke 21, you'll find the um, Olivet, what they call the Olivet Discourse, which is Christ describing his, his second coming and the gathering of people and so on and, and the wars and rumors of wars and all that. They're synoptic. That means they are similar in their story and their storyline. John's different. You have three cardinal dimensions. You have this way, this way, and this way, and it's all the same to us. But that fourth direction is different. Think of this one. Think of um, Leah, Billa, Zilla, and Rachel. You know who those are? Those are the four that birthed the 12 tribes. And Leah and Zillah and Billah are pretty much the same in that Jacob didn't want them. Rachel's different. He was his true love, or she was his true love. Boy, I said that wrong. She was different. You have three in the fiery furnace, and you have one who joins them. He's the fourth. He's different. He's like the Son of Man. You have three beasts coming up in Daniel chapter 7. Three beasts rising up, and three of them, it, it mentions, and then the fourth one is diverse from the other three. Are you seeing these patterns here? This fourth kingdom is not like any other earthly kingdom that has ever existed on the earth. It's different. The place they come from is different. Their bodies are different. Very, very, very interesting with this Bible. And I taught this a while ago. We have spirit, soul, body, and the new body. The new body is different than this one. Now watch this, okay? Here's a picture of how you're made. Even your, even your physical body is a shadow of what's to come. Your DNA and, th and remember this, DNA is like the two books of the Bible. David said, in thy book, all my members were written. So it's the book of God, it's Old Testament, New Testament, those are the two rungs of the ladder, and the Old Testament and the New Testament are joined together by the four. Adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine. Here's the interesting thing. When you just have one rung of the ladder, you don't have DNA, you have what's called RNA. It is a single rung form of DNA, but it's ribonucleic acid. Ribonucleic acid actually has the four chemicals in it, but one of them is different. You have adenine, guanine, cytosine, but in RNA, when it's just the single, like the Old Testament, it's uracil. But here's what happens when the Old Testament joins with the New Testament. Uracil is taken out and replaced with thiamine. It's different. 
That's right. It, we are even, even our bodies are a shadow of things to come, pointing us to the four Gospels, the beauty of salvation by grace through faith. Now, watch this one, okay? I had made this graphic years ago, decided not to change it. Christ's first coming starts us off in the four Gospels, starts off with the book of Matthew. From Genesis 1 to the end of the Old Testament was roughly four, well, from Genesis 1 to the coming of Christ was 4,000 years. From the end of the Old Testament to Matthew was 400 years. Matthew is the 40th book of the Bible, and it begins the four Gospels. And you see the verse, Galatians 4.4, 4, but when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman made under the law. And so the interesting thing here is, is that all of this stuff in the Old Testament gives way by way of this, this number four to the newness of the New Testament. In other words, the Old Testament is all about what's on the earth, what it applies to the flesh and earthly things, your earthly tabernacle, earthly sacrifices, uh, earthly commandments, and so on. But the New Testament is about heavenly things. So this was a three-dimensional shadow of heavenly things, the fourth spatial direction. And it's in the book of Matthew, the 40th book of the Bible, that the, for the very first time you see the phrases, kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God. You don't see that in the Old Testament. You don't see any mention of the kingdom of heaven in the Old Testament. It starts in the 40th book of the Bible, the New Testament, in the four Gospels. Because it's not a kingdom that is just on this earth. It is a kingdom of heaven. So think about this. The Old Testament speaks of an earthly tabernacle. The New Testament speaks of a heavenly tabernacle. The Heavenly, the Old Testament speaks of earthly Jerusalem. The New Testament speaks of Jerusalem, which is above heavenly Jerusalem. Notice how it's built. Revelation 21, 16, and the city lieth four square. It's not of this. It wasn't built here on this. That's why the Tower of Babel is faulty. It wasn't built on this earth. It's not made of man-made or earthly materials. It is the city of God in heaven. That is our real, our continuing city, the Bible says. That's what Abraham was looking for. Never found it. Oh, he's, he's there now. He is there. He found the city that he was looking for. The Old Testament always deals with the flesh. That's why it's the law of sin. The New Testament deals with the spirit. Let's look in the fourth book of the New Testament, the Gospel of John. John 3, 6, that which is born of the flesh, Old Testament, is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit, New Testament, is spirit. Galatians chapter 4, verse 25, for this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. And so the Jews are still looking for a Messiah in the earthly city of Jerusalem. That's not where he's coming from. He's coming from heavenly Jerusalem. The Old Testament deals with the flesh. The New Testament, the spirit. The Old Testament, first birth. New Testament, God is my father, not Milton Hoggard. And Jerusalem is my mother. Not Judy Hawkins. See, my mom and dad, they love me. They could not produce a good child. They themselves were not good. They produced corruption. Only a spiritual father and a spiritual mother can bring forth a spiritual child. That's me. That's what's promised in the New Testament. We, we talked about Leah, Rachel, Bill, and Zillah. We talked about those three. They are a picture of the Gospels in that earthly tribes were born of four, and they were a shadow. Remember the guy who was brought to Jesus, and he couldn't walk? How many men were carrying him? Four. Think
think about this. Think about Christ being a high priest. And he wasn't from the tribe of Levi, was he? In Genesis chapter 29, Aaliyah conceived and bare a son, and she called his name Reuben. So we have Reuben, we have Simeon, we have Levi. Stop right here. That's where the priesthood comes from. The earthly priesthood of the Old Testament is Levi. Number three, three dimensions. Judah is the fourth. And so what does the Bible say? Hebrews 7, 11, If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, which is the Old Testament, the three-dimensional realm, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? For the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. For he of whom these things are spoken pertaineth to another tribe, of which no man gave attendance at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning the priesthood. And yet it is yet far more evident, for after that the similitude of Melchizedek, there ariseth another priest. And Hebrews 5.10, God called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Christ was not from Judah, the three, the third son, the three dimensions. Moses was, was a Levite. Aaron was a Levite. All that law pertained to the things of this world. But Christ, the high priest, you would think, well, if he's the high priest, he should be from the Levites. No, he wasn't. He wasn't from the third son. He was from the fourth. And Melchizedek, I believe, is the, and the order of Melchizedek is an angelic order of priests. You'll see them all throughout the book of Revelation. You'll see these angels, and that is the order of Melchizedek. And Christ, being from the fourth, Judah, is showing that he is from the heavenly priesthood, not the earthly. All these people want to take you back to the law in the, in the Old Testament. They're trying to get you cursed under the law and under this earth. Christ wants to set us free in heavenly places. And by the way, the gospel, where was it supposed to go? Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. When Ezekiel was told to prophesy to the dry bones, what was he to prophesy to? Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain that they may live. He didn't say three winds. He didn't say, okay, ready, one, two, three. He didn't say that. Four winds, four gospels, for, to the heavenly realm. When Israel lives again, they're not going to be reborn in the flesh, reborn in the spirit. Just like you and I. I love that. And then four times now, this is where we're going to stop right here. And I want you to ponder this. Because we have this overwhelming idea that the number four represents the spiritual realm and the gospel. And it's after 4,000 years, after 400 years, in the 40th book, in the four Gospels, we have a, the proclamation of the kingdom of heaven, not of this earth. So now watch this. Paul warned us four times in Scripture. 2 Corinthians 11, 4. Another Gospel, which you have not accepted. Galatians 1, 6. Another Gospel. Verse 8, any other gospel. Verse 9, any other gospel. Let him be accursed. Four times we're warned. So if there is a true gospel related to this number, there is a false one. And next week we'll start showing you the connection between the fourth gospel, or excuse me, the fourth kingdom, and remember, the gospel, 1 Corinthians 15, is what turns mortals into immortals. Remember what the devil said. You shall be as gods. You shall not surely die. That is the basis of a false gospel related to the fourth kingdom and the fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, and the curse of of disobeying God, not accepting Christ by faith. I give you a lot of information here, a lot of, I mean, this whole idea of, of the four dimensions, I cannot grasp it, I cannot perceive of it. All I can do is show you what it's like in the scriptures, and now we see the connection. This fourth kingdom is not of this earth. It is from a different place. 
That's why they have so much power over us, over mankind. So we'll show you more of the connection between the fourth kingdom and another gospel next week. Hope you're enjoying this, putting a lot of work into this. I myself am studying things now that I've never studied before, just so I can get an understanding of this for you. You study the scriptures as well. Now that you kind of know what to look for, you'll see these things come to light. This is Pastor Mike. God bless you. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.